one of the most frequent questions I get on the channel is Maximus what got you so interested in aviation? Well today I'm going to tell you because once long ago I thought I was going to be a professional pilot and this is the story about my very first flying lesson and it was also the very first time I ever flew in an airplane period. But even though this is a video to watch, it's also a great video you can just listen to in the car or download it and listen to it later. But either way, get comfortable, grab a drink, and maybe a good cigar as I tell you the very true story of my very first flying lesson next on Maximus. It was July of 1981. I was a 16-year-old New Jersey transplant living in South Florida at the time. But for some odd reason, one day, clear out of the blue, I thought to myself, you know what, I think I want to learn how to fly a plane. However, this was really a strange idea, because previously to this specific moment in time, I had zero interest in flying. And as a matter of fact, I wouldn't even take my first commercial flight until I was 18 years old two years later. Still, for some reason, on this stifling, sticky South Florida afternoon, I decided I was going to leave the air-conditioned comfort of my red, white, and blue shag carpeted bedroom and venture out into the oppressive subtropical sogginess in search of a flight school. So with that, I descended the stairs from my second floor bedroom two at a time and strutted out the front door to my orange 1974 two-door Toyota Corolla parked on the street where it sat atop numerous oil stains deposited there from previous parkings. I used to call it the pumpkin because, well, it was small, orange, and kind of round like a pumpkin. So I put the pumpkin in neutral, gave the street a couple of kicks with my Nikes, jumped in the driver's seat, popped the clutch, slammed the door, and off I went in search of a flight school. As I mentioned, it was a typical South Florida summer day. The air so gooey thick that your eyeballs would literally fog over as soon as you dared to step outside. Meanwhile, the afternoon summer storm clouds above looked black and angry as they usually did at that time of day, with the occasional flash of lightning exploding in the distance out west over the Everglades. But I wasn't worried on this day, because after all, I was just going in search of a flight school to simply discuss the possibility of learning to fly. After all, I was just on a fact-finding mission. But surely it wouldn't be on this day that I would soar off into the wild blue yonder. I figured it would be weeks at least before I actually climbed into the cockpit of an airplane. Or would it? Once at the Palm Beach International Airport, which also served as the general aviation airport at the time, I parked the pumpkin and headed into the first flight school I saw. For legal reasons, let's call them ABC Flight School. The heavy glass door creaked and slammed behind me as I entered the small, sparsely furnished office connected to a hangar with the name of the flight school still somewhat visibly etched on the door. As I entered the cluttered office, to my left I immediately saw a sizable grease-covered good old boy sitting at an old army surplus desk with that classic Farrah Fawcett poster taped on the wall behind him. So I began to approach the grease-covered man, but he was on the phone, barking at somebody about receiving the wrong aircraft parts. As Casey and the Sunshine Bands, that's the way I like it, crackled on the small AM radio behind him. Well, as I approached the agitated man, he cupped the receiver with his meaty palm and asked in his southern accent, Can I help you, son? Why, yes, I replied somewhat confidently. I'm interested in getting some information about learning how to fly. Without saying a word, the greasy man pointed me toward another man at the desk immediately to his left, and then he went back to yelling into the grease-covered rotary dial phone. The man he pointed me to was literally asleep, or at least it appeared that way. He looked more like a burnt-down surfer dude than a pilot. With his flip-flop covered feet comfortably resting atop another military surplus avocado green metal desk, he was leaning back in his oversized reclining office chair against a window facing the tarmac outside. He was wearing one of those handmade straw kind of cowboy hats with the hay covered brim resting on his nose concealing his eyes. I briefly stopped approaching the surfer dude for a second and looked back at the greasy agitated man on the phone. But without taking a break from his ranting and raving, he just vigorously waved me to continue on my way, kind of shooing me on to the sleeping surfer dude. So as soon as I reached the tip of his flip-flops hanging off his desk, without looking up, the young surfer guy said, Dude. Yes, he actually said, Dude. 
Dude, so you want to learn how to fly, he asked, with his chin still tucked in his chest. And before I can finish exhaling the word yes from my mouth, he hurled a set of keys at me, which I surprising actually caught. Suddenly, he pulled his flip-flops off his desk and his World War II surplus off his chair let out a series of creaks and groans as he stood up and hung his shabby straw hat on a hook and said, all right then, let's go. And with that, we were on our way out of the office headed into the hangar. As he strolled away with me in tow, he called out to the big greasy guy and barked, Hey Bobby, how's that 152? It was at that point that I figured the big angry greasy guy's name was Bobby. Bobby told the surfer pilot dude, Yup, good to go, fix the mags this morning. And with that, the surfer dude was headed out into the hangar. Still gripping the strange set of keys I was given, I trailed the surfer dude, urgently prodding him. Um, excuse me, I asked. Where are we going? To get a plane, he said. Now, of course, the surfer dude had an actual name. But for the purposes of this story and other possible legal reasons, let's just call him Brody. So as we walked deeper into the hangar, I told Brody that I don't think he understood. I said, I just want to learn how to fly. That's when he stopped, turned, and said, Dude, what do airplanes do? Well, cut off guard and a bit confused at the question, at first I thought to myself, this must be my first test or something. But I answered him with more of a question, really, and said, They fly? Exactly, Brody said. And then he asked, And where do airplanes fly? To which I answered him with another question, In the sky? To which he replied again, Exactly. So now I'm just confused and snapped back. Ex exactly what? He said, look, you came here to learn how to fly, right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to fly, he said. Then I shot back, but you don't even know me. To which he replied, still walking farther ahead. That's true, dude, but I will soon. So it took a minute for that entire conversation to register. Now we're outside of the hangar walking toward the Cessna 152 trainers that are tied down on the tarmac. And that's when it hit me. You know, like that scene in My Cousin Vinny at the moment when Ralph Macchio finally realizes why he was arrested? Whoa! Wait a minute! So as we finally reached the small blue and white planes, I blurted out, Wait a minute! Isn't there like some kind of stuff you need to teach me on the ground first? Like book stuff or pictures or something? He said, look dude, anything you can learn in a book, you can learn in the air. But I quickly reminded him, but I didn't even sign up yet. Aren't there some forms or papers I need to sign? After all, I said, I'm only 16. But Brody said, you got a driver's license, don't you? Well, yeah, I said. Your parents know you're here, right? And I said, yeah, well, kinda. Well, there you go, he said. Then he saw I was a bit nervous and confused and said, look, relax. I've been doing this a long time. Let's just get up in the air and after we get back, if you still think you want to be a pilot, there will be plenty of time for forms and ground school. But then I asked, what about the money? How much is this going to cost me? Nothing, dude. He said, first one's on me. Now at this point, every ounce of my body was telling me to run away, get in the pumpkin and go to the arcade and play some Tempest. Oh, if you never heard of Tempest, look it up. It's amazing. Or just ask your parents. But I didn't run away for some reason. I liked the surfer dude's logic. Somehow it made sense and I said, Okay, let's do this. Now to be sure you need to understand. Brody was indeed an excellent pilot. A bit odd, but a great pilot. And as I would later find out, he was an even better instructor. Once at the plane, he walked me through the entire pre-flight checklist. We checked the fuel, the props, the ailerons, the flaps, rudder, the whole deal. At the time, of course, I had no clue what any of that was, but he seemed to be satisfied, so we untied the plane from the ground hooks and climbed in. He told me to get in the left seat, and he sat in the right. Once inside, he gave me the once-over of all the instruments and controls, yoke, flaps, throttles, mixtures, gauges, magnetos, and all the rest. And then I finally found out what that set of keys he threw me was for. They were to start the plane. For some reason, I thought planes didn't use keys. So he showed me where to insert the keys, and then he told me something I thought was just plain odd. He said to yell out the window the words clear prop, which felt kind of stupid because we were all alone on the tarmac. But I did just that, and I turned the keys, and she cranked right up. And oh boy, I gotta tell you, when that plane first fired up, and I felt that shimmy. You know, the one you feel when the prop first catches and the engine turns over. That was a rush. 
But now at this point, I was also feeling a combination of thrilled and terrified. Brody did all the pre-flight checks like a pro, talked to the tower, set the fuel mixtures, the whole nine yards. So now it was time to move on to the taxiway. I gotta admit by now I was still terrified but more excited than scared. I was going to take my first flight in a plane and this professional pilot was going to show me how it's done. So maybe someday in the near future I'll be able to be the one doing the flying. On the taxiway he got me familiar with the rudders and how to keep the plane on the center line which I did pretty well. Meanwhile Brody continued talking to the tower, flipping switches and turning knobs, configuring the plane for takeoff. So we finally reached the end of the taxiway and it was time to do the pre-flight run up to make sure the engine was set for takeoff. So we went through the checklist, brake set, fuel on, takeoff trim set, flight controls good and so on. Then we bring the RPMs up to do a final mag check. So I turn the key to the left, magneto position sounds good, RPMs are good. Then I switch to the right mag to check it and suddenly the plane starts to buck, shudder and shake. That's when Brody started cursing Bobby. You remember Bobby, the big greasy guy on the phone from earlier? Yeah, that Bobby. To me, the plane's engine felt like my car when it was about to stall, and I had plenty of experience with that. But you gotta remember, at this point, I know nothing about anything having to do with aircraft. I'm just flipping switches like a trained monkey that the instructor is telling me to do. So Brody played with the fuel mixture a few more times, and I turned the key back and forth a few times, and still the magneto wasn't firing right. I gotta be honest with you at this point, I was relieved I wasn't going to fly that day, because the thought of crashing on my first flight suddenly entered my mind. I started to take our present situation as a sign that maybe this pilot thing isn't for me. So Brody told the tower we're going to go back to the hangar. As we taxied back to the hangar along the way, I nervously made small talk with Brody and asked, so does this kind of thing happen often? To which he said, no, not really, it's kind of a first for me too. But then he half cocked his head in my direction and with a reassuring grin said, nah, I'm just kidding. It happens sometimes. It's no big deal, he said. But then I said, well, that's okay. We can set a time for me to come back another day and try it again. Hoping he would agree with me. I could just get back in the pumpkin and reevaluate my life choices. But Brody said, hell no, dude, we're going to fly today. We still got time before the weather gets gnarly. We're going to drop this one off and pick up another plane and try it again. Well, at that point, I, I gotta tell you, I really wished I was wearing a diaper because I felt queasy just at the thought of getting back into another airplane right away. But to my credit, I toughed it out and Brody and I got a new plane. And before you know it, we were lined up on the General Aviation Runway 10 left at Palm Beach International Airport, cleared for takeoff. Having the plane already configured, we were ready to go. And that's when Brody said, okay, dude, give us some gas, push in the throttle. I hesitated and Brody prodded again, let's go, push it in. And that's when it hit me. On my very first day ever at an airport on my very first time in any type of airplane at 16 years old, I was in the middle of a runway with a flight instructor who may or may not be a surfer and possibly a part-time drug smuggler. I was about to take off in an airplane as a pilot. Now, of course, Brody knew what he was doing and he was there the whole way. And maybe many pilots were and are trained this way. But for me, as a virgin aviator at the time, I thought this was just the freaking coolest thing ever. So Brody talked me through the takeoff and before you knew it, we were rolling down the runway. I held the center line pretty well with a little help from Brody. Then I eased back on the yoke and suddenly we were off the ground climbing out over Palm Beach above the Atlantic Ocean. The amazing thing was that as I was bathing in my own glory that I was actually flying an airplane. As I glanced over at Brody to express my glee, he was chilling, just looking at his window down at the ocean below and talking about the waves. I remember he said, pretty choppy today. I asked him, hey, shouldn't you be looking at me or out the front window or something? He said, why, you're doing fine. But in that glance over at Brody, I noticed that he did have his fingertips under his yoke and his feet over his rudder pedals in the event he needed to step in. It was then that I was able to relax and start taking in the big picture, and the big picture was beautiful. I wanted to stay over the ocean for a while, but soon he told me to turn left and then left again, and we were now headed west at about 4,000 feet. I thought, why were we heading west instead of east? I figured we'd practice over the ocean a bit. So I asked, why are we going west? That's when Brody said, well, we have to practice over the Everglades. That way, in case we crash, we won't hurt anybody on the ground and we'll still be pretty easy to find. Well, suddenly I wasn't so calm anymore. 
especially because out west in Florida is where all those scary black thunderstorm clouds develop in the afternoon, and we were headed directly in that direction. But once over the Everglades, I got comfortable with the basics of flight and how the plane turns and just getting familiar with the aircraft, just kind of flying in circles above the snakes and gators in the swamp below. And before I knew it, it was time to head back to the airport. However, we still had one more task to accomplish. It's called stalling the aircraft. Again, sitting here today, I know that stalls aren't a big deal and nothing to be afraid of. But back then I had no clue what a stall really was. All I knew was it sounded like a really bad idea. But Brody explained it was no big deal. All you do is just pull back on the yoke and the nose of the plane will rise. As the plane loses airspeed and lift, then the nose of the plane will suddenly drop. After the nose drops, all you have to do is add power and pull back on the yoke again and you recover from the stall. Piece of cake, he said. Piece of cake, I thought to myself. Sounded more like a poo sandwich. So it started to get a little bumpy as the weather started to deteriorate and the lightning strike seemed to move closer and closer as the sky grew darker and the air grew more turbulent. So that just added to my anxiety. But still for the time being, the weather was far enough behind us. So Brody told me just pull back on the yoke and let the nose keep rising. And just before we stall, you'll start hearing a warning horn buzzer kind of thing letting you know you're about to stall. But don't worry about that, that's normal. But for some reason with this sudden flood of information I was frozen in level flight in no hurry to experience this thing called a stall. Especially with a horn buzzer kind of thingy. But with reassuring prodding from Brody, eventually I started to gently pull back on the yoke. And by gently, I mean like one degree at a time kind of gently. But Brody kept telling me more, more, pull back more. Yet still out of sheer fear of the unknown, I just gingerly kept gently pulling back on the yoke. Cause heck, I didn't know what a stall was. I thought the plane would just drop out of the sky. So finally Brody had had enough and said, no dude, like this. So he grabbed his yoke and just yanked it back to his belly. And suddenly my belly was in my throat and the nose of the plane was up in the air. And that buzzer alarm thingy started going off. And that's when he said, now push in the throttle and pull back on the yoke. And just like that, we were out of the stall. So after that, we practiced some more stalls and turns and circled above the alligators in the Everglades below a few more times. And then it was time to head back to the airport. As we got closer to the airport, I thought it was cool that we were racing a big shiny blue and silver Eastern Airlines 727 landing on the parallel commercial runway to our left. But by now it started to rain and the storm was getting closer to us. Then suddenly Brody said, okay, you ready to land this thing? I said, what do you mean land this thing? Like, like me by myself? He said, yeah, dude, don't worry about it. I'll be right here. So all the way down, Brody walked me through the landing one step at a time. And before I knew it, the wheels kissed the runway and we completely graced the landing. And once again, I looked over at Brody and once again, he was looking out his window, taking in the view of the wet and now suddenly sunny runway and not at me, but still with the yoke near his fingertips and his feet over the pedals. And suddenly he turned to me and said, so dude, how'd you like your first flying lesson? And at the moment, the only thing I could think of to reply was, dude. Now I'm sure many of you in this very safe time of modern aviation may think maybe Brody wasn't a very professional instructor or careless or just dopey. And maybe he was. But for me personally, I think he was a great teacher. Because even though at times he gave me the impression he wasn't paying attention, he was always 100% completely in control the entire time. And I just think that Brody's style of teaching was just to throw you in the deep end of the pool type and let you swim your way back. It was really almost a litmus test to see who really wanted to be a pilot and who just thought they wanted to be a pilot. Plus, like I said, remember, it was over 40 years ago. I mean, you could still smoke in hospitals and on airplanes, and people still thought seatbelts in cars was a stupid idea. As I said, the world was a much different place back then. But after a few more lessons, Brody quickly took me under his wing. Literally. He had a side job flying twin engine planes back and forth to the Bahamas and Bimini Island and would always invite me to come along so he could show me how to learn multi-engine flying. And I still kick myself to this day for not taking him up on the offer. 
But eventually a blue-eyed blonde girl in Fort Lauderdale drew my attention away from flying and I never really went back to it. At least not as a pilot anyway. And besides, like I said this was 1981 and Brody never seemed to be flying passengers on these trips back and forth to the islands. And well, to be honest, I wasn't exactly sure what kind of cargo old Brody was bringing back to the US, and I prefer not knowing, cause I've seen Scarface, Miami Vice, and Cocaine Cowboys. And let's just say, well, it was a different time back in 1981, and we'll leave it at that. Eventually, I lost touch with Brody, but I like to think he flew off into the sunset doing what he loved, either flying or surfing or both. So that's the true story of my first ever flying lesson. I know it sounds a bit unbelievable, maybe dramatic or even comical, but it's all true and it's all awesome. And it's one of the greatest memories of my life. And that's why I wanted to share it with you. And now you know just a little bit more about where my love of all things aviation began. I guess as old Paul Harvey used to say, now you know the rest of the story. So how about you pilots out there? Especially you older pilots and boomers like me. Do you have any unusual or incredible stories of how you first learned to fly? Please be sure to let me know down below. Well that's gonna wrap it up for now. And on your way out, please be sure to subscribe, like, share and ring the bell. And remember, leave the rubber on the runway and your troubles on the ground. And I will see you next time in the air. Yeah.